So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Mesa Public Library in our partnership with Donna DeFrancesco, who is a conservation coordinator with the City of Mesa Environmental and Sustainability Division. She educates Mesa residents about Xeriscape, which we're going to talk about today, uh, water conservation, living green, and sustainable living. So take it away, Donna. That's it. I'm ready to go. All right. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. It's so great to, to see everyone joining us today. Uh, as Stephanie mentioned, I am talking today about Xeriscape, landscaping with style in the Arizona desert. Uh, as I go through the program today, you're going to see if some plant pictures uh, here and there that just, of course, make nice backgrounds or add an ad addition to the slide. So when I do that, I have uh, placed the name of the plant somewhere on that slide. So you'll see that. And I'm going to talk about a little resource page I'll have available for you. And I'll list all the plants on that page as well. The other thing is uh, you all of you just heard that this is being recorded. So this is gonna be available um, after the, the talk. And so you'll be able to go back to it if you miss something, uh, if you just wanna go back and review or share it with others that you are working with. Okay. Oh, and I forgot to mention, if anyone has questions, you can put them in the chat and we'll address them later on. Thank you. So here's what we're going to zoom through today is kind of our situation that we have here in Arizona currently, uh, and actually a lot of most of the time <laughs> being in a desert. Uh, we're going to talk about what is Xeriscape, the Xeriscape principles, uh, going to cover some of my favorite design ideas, and then finish it up with some resources for you to get more information because there's only so much I can tell you in an hour. So I want to be able to show you some places you can go to get a lot more information. So I mentioned the resource page. So if you go to this little uh, link and Stephanie, can you put this in the chat for everyone that they can either, they can click on it directly or they can copy and paste it so that they'll have it for later. Or if you wanna take a picture of it and that way you'll have it. I made it into a, uh, I reduced the size of the link. It's Bitly is the name of the program that reduces it. So sometimes you might get a warning error that it's, you know, because sometimes some computers are a little bit sensitive about that, but it is a safe link. So uh, try that out to get information about any upcoming classes we have, how to order our booklets and find other online links for information. We have an incentive that we provide for uh, up to $575 to remove grass and put in a Xeriscape. We have e-newsletters where we promote green events or we uh, talk about landscape watering. So it tells you how to sign up for those. We have information on how to hire a professional. And what's great is if you're getting education today, it's really good for you to be educated before you hire a professional. So you know a little bit more about how to talk to them and what they understand what they're wanting to do. Uh, rainwater harvesting, which we is perfect for today, and what a beautiful rainy day that we're enjoying today. Uh, even though it uh, wasn't as much as we wanted, it still will take everything we can get. Um, we have information about our composting program, and we do have like a $5 composter you can get from our solid waste department if you're a City of Mesa customer. We have information on pruning for trees and shrubs, how to find and fix leaks. And I wanna, there's also information, there's an SRP shade tree program. If you're an SRP customer, uh, there's three classes coming up in uh, August and September. So look for those, you take the program, it's also taught by Zoom. And then in the fall, you can pick up two free trees. So make sure you get information on that. Let's talk a little bit about our situation. Uh, this is a sunset picture that I took on June 14th. And it just is uh, partly was caused by the smoke that we've had in the sky. It's been kind of crazy, hasn't it? It's like states on fire, it's, we're in a drought. We have water shortages uh, on the horizon and it's just been kind of crazy. So we definitely have a lot that we're dealing with and it's really is stressful on our plants. And so there's a lot that we need to consider on how our plants and landscapes can tolerate these kinds of conditions uh, that, that we're, we're seeing and that we're concerned that we might see more of. 
And you know, our typical situation, again, we're in a desert, so we have little rainfall, typically about seven and a half to eight inches a year. We have very low humidity for the most part. Now, right now, this morning, it was great. It was, I couldn't believe it was in the 70s, but it felt so warm out because of that humidity. Normally in the 70s, we we're kind of like, oh, I got to get my sweater. But, <laughs> but typically we can, you know, have 10 to 12 percent humidity in June. Oftentimes we'll see even below that. I've seen it, you know, go five, lower than five uh, percent humidity, and it just is very dry. So that's a, that causes our plants to dry out more quickly. It actually is a little bit stressful, stressful for the plants because their leaves are drying out very quickly. They're losing a lot of moisture from there. We of course have the high heat and you know we have, we've already had our 117 so far. Who knows what will the rest of the summer will bring for us, but that sun is intense and it's really difficult. You know, the plants have to be able to tolerate that. Then we have those high winds. Those high winds actually can cause drying. Of course, they can cause other, all kinds of damage, but they can dry out the plants. But those high winds also impact our landscapes. And then what I call manipulated landscapes, you know, it's, it's like these are landscapes that started out with nothing there. And then we've come in and placed you know, gone to the nursery, bought plants, put them on in the ground, and we put little drip emitters on there, little life support systems. And so, so that's something that we have to consider is what I tell people is like, you know, we're not in Kansas anymore, right? So if you are from somewhere else in the country, uh, it's, it's understandable that you've got a lot to get up, you know, understand uh, with our with our particular situation. Uh, this is you can, I mentioned drought. This is a really great site to go to, the U.S. Drought Monitor, and it shows what's going on in the country, all across the countries with the severity of drought. So it's something, you, this was up last updated July 6th, and you can see the white means there's no drought, the abnormally dry or yellow, and then it progresses to this deep uh, maroon color, which we have quite a bit of right here in Arizona right now. And the extreme drought is all the red, which is right where we're at smack dab in the middle of that. So we can keep an eye on what's going on. You can see the West is really struggling right now, partly causing a lot of the fires. The heat that they had up Northwest was just incredible. Uh, and it's just something that uh, is just this uh, incredible weather pattern we've had lately. I just like this slide to kind of show and this is actually an older slide. Downtown's probably changed a little bit. This is downtown Phoenix, but it's from South Mountain, and it's showing that we are a city in the desert. So it's just a reminder that, yes, we live in a desert. And because of that, we do end up using a lot of water outdoors. And so we actually use more water here than we do, than, than is used in many other parts of the country because they are not watering landscapes and have the swimming pools and everything else. So we see that at least on average 50% of our household water is outdoors but even as high as 70%, and in some cases even higher, when you talk about you know, a very lush landscape with a big pool in the middle of summer, we're probably looking at up to 80% could be used outdoors. So that's another reason we wanna be careful with, with how we're using the water and ways that we do our landscaping. I also wanna show these charts real quickly to you. This is actually from 1896. My coworker pulled these for me all the way to 2020. So they ended 2020, and this is showing the uh, temperatures that we've seen over those years greater than 100 degrees. And as you can see, we definitely, you know, kind of stayed, eh, we had, it's interesting because we both noticed that there was kind of this little blurb blip here uh, in the, during the Dust Bowl years, um, that was in the 30s, and there was a little bit going on in the late 50s. But then you can see uh, an 89 crazy, uh, but up in to 2020 that we really had those uh, higher than 100. So these were higher than 189. But I'm gonna show you the next one, the, the greater than 110. And that's where you see that difference. 89, you know, dropped off. This. So they weren't over 110, They, but in 2020, you can see how we had that over 50 days uh, over 110. And so that just was really extreme. And I hope we don't end up with that again this year. I hope that was really shattered. You can see it just completely shattered the record. And then, you know, some of it's climate change. We certainly see a lot of our heat buildup is caused by the heat island effect. And that's typical for like, especially 
in our, in our cities where we have a lot of concrete and streets that heat up and we just see that especially in the evening hours that they don't cool down. So this is showing late afternoon temperatures and it just shows how, you know, especially in the urban core areas, it just stays warm even at night. And so I wanted to also look at the minimum temperatures. And so I'm talking about the light, the lows, the nighttime lows. So this is one that shows uh, the lows that were greater than 75. And actually that's not too bad. Plants do need a break. They do need a cooling in between their, uh, you know, cool temperatures in order to function and, and photosynthesize properly. So, but you can see again, it's climbed over the years. Again, we're going 1896 to 2020 and those nighttime temperatures above 75. Well, here's, I'm sorry, this one's a little blurry, but here's showing the nighttime temperatures greater than 80. And so where they never cool down less than 80. And you can see again um, that we've, that we had some, again, just it's climbing. We actually, I guess this it looks like in, this was almost peak. It actually last year wasn't peak, but that was greater than 80. And then the next slide shows, this is a little more dramatic. Again, very interesting, minimum temperatures greater than 90. The most fascinating thing about this slide, 1896 through 1967, eight, somewhere in there, pretty much flatlined, again, besides the 30s, probably during the Dust Bowl era. But then look at how uh, in 2020, minimum temperatures greater than 90 degrees, ridiculous and, and very hard stressful on your plants. Uh, that's, that's what we saw. All right. So kind of our situation, why we why we really want to emphasize that we need these to, to learn about great principles that'll get our landscapes more resilient and better able to tolerate, especially some of these harsh conditions. So let's talk about what is Xeriscape. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what it means and how and I mentioned this in the promo. How do you say it? Because that's one of the things that we find. It, it is kind of a tricky word. Um, it is derived from the Greek word zeros, which is Greek for dry plus scape, a scene. So pronunciation is zero scape and how not to say it or the one, you know, I, I always know people have different ways of pronouncing things, but we always kind of cringe when we hear people say zero scape. So it's understandable why you might say it that way. Uh, but when, when we hear zero scape, we just don't want people to think it means there's nothing there. It's rocks and cactus, rocks and yeah, cactus and maybe a cow skull. So that's just something to keep in mind. So everybody say it with me, zero scape. <laughs> I don't know if everybody said it. Sally, I saw you were saying it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, so just other examples for you is, you know, it's this word's used in a lot of other ways. So you hear about xeric environments. So that's where we're talking about deserts. There's xerophytes, which are desert plants. My favorite, Xerox, a dry copy. And they, you know, when they came about, that was when we were still doing mimeograph copies. And I know I am definitely dating myself, but I remember getting our mimeograph copies in school and we would take them and smell them because they smelled like glue or something. I don't know what, was. <laughs> but we all, probably wasn't good for us, but we like smell them. Anyway, so, uh, and then of course, zero escapes. And we're gonna be talking about uh, Everything we're talking about is in a great book that we have available and uh, Zero Escape Landscaping with Style. Uh, but so I'm going to talk about that in a second. But the origin of this term, it's a trademark name that was developed by Denver Water Department in 1981. And what's interesting is they were going through drought at the time and they went ahead and came up with the whole idea and the concept and the principles. And at first, when I was first kind of in the, on the scene in, in water conservation, we weren't even sure we could say zero escape without getting permission from Denver Water. So we were all, because it was trademarked and they, you know, they were kind of being picky about who used it and how, how and why. And so it finally just became, you know, commonplace to use it. But at first it was funny that we were just so uh, 
concerned about how we used it and getting permission and everything. So the booklet, there's also an online version of this and all this will be available on how you can even request the booklet and get all this information. But I wanna show, I always show this when I actually do a live class and I'm sorry, you're not gonna be able to see it just in the little window, I guess, in the corner, but um, there's this really fun thing about the book and it has these little, little yellow tabs and it's got a little saguaro drawing in there. So the idea behind it, it's really fun, is just if you flip the pages, the saguaro grows arms and it even blooms. So <laughs> now you are part of the elite that you know that about this book. You definitely need to request a copy and, um, and make sure you check that out and you can share, share that fun thing with anyone you, you'd like. Okay, so let's look at it defined. Basically, it's good design with efficient irrigation and proper plant selection and maintenance. It's also been defined as water conservation through creative landscaping, a simple kind of a simple term for it. And then um, last one that I actually stole from somebody, I forget where I saw this, but I thought it was really cute. Landscape design with water in mind. So basically it, it is, making sure, oh, and the last one, sorry, the last point is that it is defined by not by seven common sense principles. And that's what we're going to go through next. So the Xeriscape principles. And I, I actually selected this picture. This actually is a fun landscape. And I think I've got a picture of it later on, some other elements of it. But I, I did think it was funny that it had the cow skull. So I just wanted to add that. But in this case, it was kind of a whimsical landscape and it works. What I don't like to see is just a landscape with a cow skull and rocks and a cas cactus or two. All right, so the principles, they are planning and design. I'm gonna go through each of these individually. Appropriate turf areas, efficient irrigation, grading and soil evaluation, the use of mulches, lots of mulches, please low water use plants and appropriate maintenance. So this makes up those seven common sense principles. And what's really cool about Xeriscape, I think, is I, I remember years ago that, that I met some women from Canada and they said, oh, we use this up there. And it's just something you don't think about using in other parts of the country like that. But it makes total sense that no matter where you are, you know, you either want efficient irrigation or maybe you don't even need efficient irrigation because you do get enough rainfall. Uh, but all of these things really make sense to use anywhere in the country. And they're just these common sense ideas. Okay, so planning and, and design. What you wanna do is, is and, and this is something that I know some of you may be looking at a new brand new landscape, but others may be just renovating, or you might just want to understand a little bit more of the principles to utilize when you're, when you're doing your maintenance and things like that. So, but if you are especially starting out, or even if you want to transition your landscape, uh, think about your landscape theme, your design goals, how you want your landscape to function and your landscape zones. This is uh, right here, there's a drawing that's from the Xeriscape book. And I think it's also, on, I'm, I'm sure it's also on the online version, but this is just a, what they call a kind of a, a site drawing a bubble, what we call a bubble diagram. <laughs> so you're kind of placing your, your home boundaries on, the, on a piece of paper and you're showing what your landscape area is. And then you start defining some things that you want to start seeing. And so it's kind of a fun way to go about where you can just have, you know, maybe just you want the front yard just to be more for color and curb appeal and that kind of stuff. But in the back, you might have functional areas, a seating area under a shade tree. In this case, they're marking out a swimming pool. Um, they are marking out a small lawn area. And then there they've got uh, accent plants and things here more shade plants, but you might want to look at screening some view or you want to make sure you leave a view open if you've got a great view of the mountains. So the, you might have a garden area, you might have your compost area. So that's where, and then you might have a path, you might want to mark where you need to walk through. So things like that, that you start looking at your, your design of how you want to do it. And make a wish list, you know, do you want 
a play area or do you need something for the kids do you need something for the dog uh, or do you love to entertain do you want the barbecue and just patios or what that might be are you wanting to attract wildlife then you want to select certain plants that are going to help you do that and do your landscaping a certain way and i'll talk about that in a little bit a quiet place to relax so this is my backyard you know a shady backyard retreat where you can just kind of sit read a book um and, and enjoy the outdoors color and shade so sometimes it's really great you can make sure you select plants so that you have year-round color you have something blooming and then it'll you know take a rest and you got something else that picks up um, and then just that shade is so critical here. We, we always realize that this time of year and we're all fighting for that shady spot in the parking lot, right? You might wanna block or enhance your views. And so you wanna look at that. I know in some cases, you know, there might be somebody that's that has a truck they park, you know, off the side of their house all the time. That's right, you know, a view that you would see and you could look at putting plants up that could block that for you. So that's something else to consider. Uh, and then things like vegetable or fruit gardening, certainly. And then pools or spas or those kinds of things. So think about those things on your wish list uh, before you get started. And then consider your style and your theme. And this was kind of a fun uh, backyard that I was out doing a, one of our landscape incentive inspections and this is actually a shed out in the back but I thought it was so cute how they just you know put the bright blue shutters and the planter box and you know just very colorful and fun so you know what defines your style and one of the things I had heard from a, a landscape designer one time is that how you grew the, the years that you were between about three and I think it was like seven really can define what kind of style you like. And I think for me, I grew up in New England. I grew, grew up in you know these rural areas of New Hampshire with little brooks and things like that nearby. So I definitely like my landscape design to be more naturalistic. But um, so it might be how you, you know, that, that might impact how you feel about what your style is. So is it gonna be more formal or naturalistic? Um, are you looking for something southwest or tropical? Does tropical appeal to you? You know, it just makes you feel uh, like, you know, and you can still pick plants that'll work very well for that here. Um, do you want to extend your living space outdoors really well and just make it open up from your patio or just make outdoor spaces? Are you looking at the edible landscaping and those kinds of things? Okay. And these are just some examples. So this is kind of a uh, interesting, it might even be in Tucson, but kind of air, uh, a historic territorial style Southwest home. But you can see that this style uh, worked, it works very well to go with the native plant palette. They have, you know, Palo Verdes and an Ocotillo and uh, this, this, uh, oh, I'm blanking on what this is, uh, but certainly the desert marigolds and looks like fairy duster. So just some nice native plants that, that really work well with just some natural flagstone in the decomposed granite there. And, you know, this one's almost more of almost like a cottage type garden to me. I love that they've got, this was here in Mesa and I love the, the nice little arbor they have here and just very colorful, but you can tell this would be a real easy landscape to maintain. They just did a very good job so it's this is a big leaf cordia plant. These are the Arizona yellow bells, of course, Hesperello, of course, the lantana. I'm not sure. These almost look like Aramophila, but I'm not sure which ones those are. But just fun little landscape. And this is the landscape that had the cow skull that I showed you earlier. Again, I was mentioning that it was very whimsical. And I just thought it was fun that they did this, you know, the, the wheelbarrow and it looks like the plants spilling out of it. So they did a lot of creative things like that in this landscape. Yeah, I apologize I didn't that, that this came out fuzzier than I thought, but this is just, again, a landscape. This was in East Mesa where they just did a lot of wildflowers, very much a uh, native plant palette. It can be very, very colorful and beautiful, kind of mirroring the, the desert. And then I want to talk about energy conservation here because again, planting the trees, on south and west sides of the home really are extremely helpful in cooling or keeping your home cooler, and especially if those are deciduous trees, you get the shade in the summer, but they'll drop their leaves 
and you'll get the sun coming in in the winter when we really do want that sunshine. And that's why SRP offers that shade tree program where they give you two free trees, by the way. Um, now, hopefully, you know, style and theme, <laughs> it's very personal, right? I always say well, landscaping can be like how you dress yourself. Everybody's got a different style, um, but this is pretty formal and it's, uh, it's going to be high maintenance, so think about that kind of thing. But it is very creative. I have to give the guy credit for the uh, the, the the beautiful job he did here uh, with shaping his his plants. Uh, and hopefully, at least this does have a theme. It's a theme of love. But I don't <laughs> recommend this. I understand why this sometimes is uh, used if people are not year-round visitors and uh, they are concerned about maintenance when they're gone but and at least it's very attractively done <laughs> but we really need those plants to improve our environment and everybody can do their part to help out with planting trees and green plants that help absorb carbon dioxide and that absorb uh, or give off oxygen for us. And this was just a funny one, which I took a picture of this in downtown Phoenix. <laughs> I guess it's a Zen theme, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure how this landscape ended up. All right, we're two. Designs always takes the longest on the Xeriscape principles. The others will go much quicker, I promise. So the second principle was efficient irrigation. Just make sure that you do have a good design. Use drip irrigation type systems, which definitely apply the water directly where it's needed and it's not like the big you know flood irrigation that we have still here in the valley here or or just spraying the whole area with water the drip irrigation allows us to place that water directly at the plant roots and the other thing we've got available now is irrigation technologies that help us water better in this particular case i i picked this photo because it is a nice picture of what we call a shrubbler. So it's it's a type of drip emitter, but these are the ones that you can crank them up or down. What's nice is that they do provide you with the ability to provide more or less water. The, the thing that I would say is not good design here is that it's right next to a cactus that probably doesn't need very much water. At a minimum, you know, usually for cactus, we would put like a half gallon per hour emitter, and I would think this could be putting out four to five gallons an hour. Now that would be okay if, if they've got it really balanced out and they're running it for just minutes rather than hours, uh, but uh, the other thing about the shrublers, if you do decide to use these, make sure you go to one of the irrigation wholesale stores and ask them for what's called pressure compensating. If you don't remember that word, just tell them you want the ones that are really efficient. Pressure compensating just means that if this shrubler is at the very beginning of your irrigation line, and then you have another one you know, uh, let's say 30 feet away at the end of the irrigation line, this one's always going to be giving off more water because as the pipe fills up, this one's going to just start flowing. When they're pressure compensating, they kind of make sure the whole system gets balanced before they start emitting. And so it helps to make the application more even throughout your entire system, if that makes sense. This is one of the things that we encourage highly. Again, more than likely, if you've got uh, inherited a, a landscape and the irrigation system that's there, you might have what we call the one valve wonder, right? So you've got just one, uh, one valve that opens up and applies water to the entire uh, landscape. The reason why we prefer to see the different zones or valves, uh, and let's look at it, I want to show you these would be like, let's say your timers here and there's valves that block, there's a valve box that has three different valves on the ground. And so this red one, it looks like it's providing water to all the shrubs, right? So you can see it move all around the landscape to the shrubs. And then the purple one is actually, looks like it's going over here. Maybe that's a little garden or something. It looks like it's some specialty planted area. And then the orange one is going just to the trees. So the biggest difference on that is we, when we talk about watering, we'll talk about that in a minute, there's different watering frequencies that we 
recommend because trees get a much deeper watering, but then they go longer periods in between watering. And they're usually larger, so it, they need to run longer times. So that's why it really is nice if you have the different, uh, different valves. Now in our landscape watering booklet, we do give you ideas on how to mitigate that if that's your situation. So you can look in the book to, to see how you might be able to, you know, we recommend putting extra mulch around the shrub so you can go longer periods in between watering uh, and putting different sized emitters and that kind of stuff. But it really is nice if you've got them separated. The technologies, there's these smart controllers. And I don't know if you've heard of the smart controllers. Here's an example, one that's called Ratio. And this is, I, I put this picture in and you can't hardly see it, but she's uh, this, this person here that I was talking to, they had a box that had, a, looks like a um, rainbird type smart controller in the box. And this is at an event called the SRP Water Conservation Expo. And they do this each year in the spring and they provide these types of controllers at a very good discount. So check that out in the spring. They actually have a little marketplace. You could just say SRP marketplace. And they, I noticed that they have a couple of the smart controllers on that marketplace. I don't know if it's the, as good of a discount as they do in the spring. But when we were doing these live, they, uh, we did it just virtually last spring, but um, we would just uh, have a, a whole bunch of booths set up. I'm here at the Water Use at Wisely booth and uh, there were city booths and we all just talked to the people who attended. They have a great turnout. So th the ratio is an example of one that you can program everything by your phone. You can monitor what's going on with the controller. And then the smart controller part of it just means that what they do, you, the, the important part is you still have to understand how to set it up properly to your site conditions. But once you get the site conditions, you're saying, let's say I have a desert landscape and it's, it's real sand, it's, it's clay soil, and you tell all those, those proper parameters, then it programs itself. So you don't have to go out there and make those adjustments as the season changes like you would a regular controller. So that's what's really nice about the smart controllers. Okay, the third zero escape principle, soil improvements. So you wanna first decide if soil improvements are required. If you're planting native plants, there's really not a whole lot you need to do to the soil itself. But if you do go out there and you see you've got, uh, and this could cause these drainage problems, but you might have caliche or you might have just hard pan. Sometimes it's just a thin layer of caliche. You might be digging and you'll see a little layer of white. Caliche is a calcium carbonate buildup. We have naturally have that in our soils. And so uh, over time, it just sometimes gets in layers or builds up. Sometimes it's just pure rock, especially if you're up near any of the uh, desert uplands and the mountain areas. So that's something to consider. Uh, so you evaluate your site, determine your soil type. And for the most part, again, anything in the valley is just through thousands of years, we have a very fine, heavy clay soil. That's very typical. Now, again, if you're near the upland areas, you might have a little more sandy, rocky, and gravelly soil. So, but most people is going to be the clay. So you also want to observe drainage to see if you have any drainage problems, and especially when you go to plant a plant, if it is real hard pan, you know, it's a good idea just to fill it full of water and see if it drains within 24 hours. If it does, you should be fine. If it doesn't, then you want to consider other things to try to break that up a little bit better. And just see if you have any other problems that are out there. It could be there was, you know, and sometimes there's just maybe was our, another plant out there already, or you just, just go out and check it out and see what's going on. And then the fourth zero escape principle, use of mulches. And the mulches are very beneficial to, of course, reduce our evaporation, which also, they, they also actually help to provide nutrients to the soil that's going to promote plant growth, of course, reducing your weed growth. So that's a great benefit. It's going to keep erosion in check. So if we have some of these downpours, it should help from getting washouts and things like that. It can add, of course, the aesthetic appeal and visual interest. 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about organic versus inorganic. You know, we, we are very heavy as far as using granite and rock here, and they are considered a mulch. They are a ground cover. Uh, again, they do heat up more, so it does, it's not going to provide as much benefit as organic mulches. So one of the things, this is um, when I was installing my landscape, and we put the, the mulch on top. So one of the things you, you may hear also is a recommendation to mix organic matter and things like that into the soil. If you're planting native plants, you don't need to do that, but we love you to put it on top of the soil and especially like chip or chipped mulch and chipped bark and things like that. It's very beneficial on the surface. Now, if you're doing a vegetable garden, if you're doing annual flowers and things like that, if there's something that's super tropical, you might want to go ahead and do the mixing it into the soil. But what they have found over years of studies is that it really is beneficial not to do that and your plants will actually do better and get established more quickly if you don't do the backfill with a, a, a specialty mix so keep that in mind so what we did though after we planted is we placed that mulch on top one of the things i want you to notice we keep it away from the bark of the tree so you keep it you know to anywhere from three to four to six inches away from the bark because if if you have that up against the trunk and then the emitter keeps it wet all the time or too wet it can cause collar rot which is just a, a, a type of fungus it'll get uh, underneath the bark right there at the, at the surface of the soil so you just want to make sure you're doing that to keep good oxygen uh, able to you know being able to get to that area the other great benefit of using organic mulches is that you you know it's a great way we can recycle green waste so Keep that in mind. And this is just I, something else I wanted to show you. This was actually a landscape I did my uh, uh, home prior, <laughs> the one I'm in. And we did, you can see we did a similar thing. We put the organic mulches in. We did all the grading. And I, actually, this is a good this is a good opportunity to talk about grading, which, will, which is also um, part of the soil improvements. But the, we wanted to be able to capture rainfall. So we, you know, we have these swales, these just depressed areas. So what we did, and you can see, you know, it's good to put plants near those swales where they're going to be able to take advantage of that moisture that's coming in. There's a swale right here. And all throughout the landscape, we just did kind of divots and just, you know, made it so that soil was almost like fluid. It was almost, you know, it's, it has movement almost. And what's interesting is when we did this, it was so, you know, it was just a flat yard before. It added so much depth and dimension. But, but getting back to mulches, I wanted to point out that we added mulch to those swales. The beauty of that, by getting organic matter into those swales, it just absorbs water. And when the rain comes down, instead of just pooling up and staying there, it's going to really percolate the water much better. And it, it just builds up over time, does much better. And, and this is something, you know, this is a beautiful agave here, but there's a Foothills Palo Verde here, again, uh, in my backyard. This was much later from that <laughs> other picture with the planting. And these are the flowers from the Foothills Palo Verde and leave that litter. So there's the plants are making their own mulch. You don't even have to do, you know, mulch. You can let the plants mulch themselves and leave it in place. And with something like the Palo Verde flowers, I always say they're so beautiful. They're beautiful on the tree and I love it when they're on the ground. They're very nutrient rich. Um, if you don't leave them on the ground or you just areas that are patio you need to clean up, if you have a compost pile, that pile they're fantastic in the compost. So keep that in mind as well. Good stuff. And then the other thing studies have shown is that this chipper, this wood chips is actually even better. And this is an example of a tree service. This is right here in Mesa. I happen to catch this. And they are out there doing tree trimming and they chip and shred. And so you can sign up at getchipdrop.com. So it's chipped. If you just Google chip drop, you should find it. And you can list yourself and they will come out if they're in your neighborhood, if they see you're on the list. And you know this keeps them from having to go to the dump and pay dump fees. So they're great with it. What you see here though, is that you gotta be ready for it. They don't always give you like only a certain amount. You can say, stop there, thank you very much. So there's a great video that they have that's actually was done by Chip Drop and it's, you should find it there and be able to find it. And it was hilarious because it's actually from them, but they they kind of give you all the, all the, you know, pluses and minuses to it. So check that out.
Okay, number five, limit turf areas. You want to make sure they're functional. Uh, when you do your planning, uh, make sure you're looking at what you want for size and what type of turf you want to put in. And then for if when you do install it, you want to make sure you do really good site prep because, you know, grass, even though Bermuda is does quite well here, it's just not a natural thing here. And so it really does require a lot of input, a lot of resources, a lot of work, and especially if you're doing overseeding. And again, I'm actually showing this picture as a bad example <laughs> because it's on this slope and you know that anytime that waters, it's just gonna be running down the hill and getting into the gutter and into the street. Uh, and yeah, this looks like it's even was winter rye. So it's, it's uh, pretty large. It's in the front yard. And one of the things I tell people, if you, you know, I understand people, and, and that's what's great about the Seriscape principles. We're like, yeah, you can have grass, but just keep it to small practical areas. And one of the things about the front yard is you're always trying to make, keep it looking good, right? So, you, you know, you're trying to make sure the neighborhoods, like, you know, neighbors aren't getting mad at you and stuff like that. Hey, if it's in the backyard, Eh, who cares if it gets you know a little long a few times so uh and of course it is rough to be out there mowing in the summer too so just think carefully about your installing grass for your xeriscape or in your landscape yeah here's i wanted to talk a little bit about that difference in the water needs this is actually actually that landscape that i was showing some of the pictures it has the wheelbarrows kind of back over here i think the cow skulls right there so this was a, a, a house here in Mesa that removed all this grass. So here's the before picture and here is the after picture. And this was pretty quickly afterwards. I wish I should try to get back out there and see how it's doing, but just want to mention the difference in water needs. So for about 3000 square feet of landscape, each year would take about 105,000 gallons for lawn and about 44,000 gallons for desert landscaping. So it's oftentimes more than half if you put in a really, you know, native type plants and a real low water use landscape, you could even be down to about a third of the water. And again, this is a good place to remind you that we have that grass to zero scape incentive for up to $550 if you do remove at least 500 square feet. And, uh, you know what it's five i should say 575 i'm sorry because uh, if you put in one tree you could get 550 if you put in two trees you get 575 so if uh so that incentive is available and i was talking uh with sally at the beginning about we have an incentive also for commercial properties up to twelve thousand. i think it's twelve thousand five hundred. so contact us if you want more information on that Okay, the sixth principle and one of our favorites, low water use plants. So the plants can provide color, of course, all kinds of form. You know, we talk about our trees creating our ceilings and, and our walls and then function might be screening, just, you know, attracting wildlife, things like that. So there's all kinds of different things that those plants will perform for us. And we also, what's great is seasonality so you can get great seasonal changes and it's just fun to be out there and go oh my gosh look this is blooming and, and oh my gosh that that popped into bloom some of the cactus are so great with that too so think about that as well i mean if you've got if you've got grass and an oleander hedge you've got very little excitement happening you know the oleanders do bloom they do a great job blooming in the spring through summer but other than that, you know, it's like nothing changing. So think about how you can add plants to add that interest. Uh, plants provide regionalism. So it kind of gives us, we have those beautiful succulents, beautiful cactus, and there's these, you know, stunning plants with these great forms and they're almost art, art in their own way. <laughs> and so, so we can uh, add those types of plants and really make it so that we look different from other places. We do want to select the plants that can, as I mentioned at the beginning, we need to have them be able to tolerate our environment. And of course they can provide wildlife habitat. And so that's something to consider. Uh, just talking real quickly about the plant adaptations. And so what we're going to be promoting is drought resistance. So that's kind of an overall term. And in some cases, 
the might be like our wildflowers that complete their life cycle before drought. And so when you think about our wildflowers, they germinate in the fall, during the fall rains, and they grow through the winter months. And then in the spring, they burst into bloom. And there should be some spring rains that help them keep going. And then they seed, they uh, go to seed and, and drop their seeds and the, the plant itself will, will die off. So it's a very smart way to avoid the drought. Um, other drought avoiders and water savers, they maintain higher tissue water. So they might be things like the cactus and succulents that hold the moisture. And then there's drought tolerance, which, you know, these are plants that are able to withstand the heat and drought, but man, when water's available, they're going to just go crazy. You know, I, I see these Palo Verdes out in the desert and it was one I remember <laughs> driving by and it's growing out of a crack and a rock. And it's like, how is that surviving? And it was a real dry period. And it's just that they, they are, they do have these adaptations where they can really tolerate the dry periods, but they're also designed that if, yay, hey, if there's water available, they are going to take up that water. And so the thing to keep in mind with that is that you know, if we put them in our landscape and we're giving them too much water and especially watering them too frequently, they, they're going to grow too much and be weak. Uh, and that's where you get some of those broken limbs or, or trees falling over. So just an example with the wildflowers. This is owls, clover, and of course, poppies and bluebells. And again, they're just going to grow during those rainy periods. And things like the cactus, those are going to be the, the ones that store the water. So prickly pear and this beautiful little pin cushion and the saguaros. And those pleats will actually expand out as the saguaro has a great rainy year and it takes up water. And, those, and then as it dries out and it's a drier period, those pleats get deeper. That also helps to shade the plant a little bit. Think about that, that too. It's interesting that those pleats help to shade it uh, when it is a drier period. Things like Ocotillo, they're going to be in leaf when things are in, in good, you know, good water sources available, and they just drop their leaves and kind of sit tight when it's not. Uh, and then the Palo Verde. This is an amazing tree that uh, it, uh, the word means green stick in Spanish because it has that green bark. The beauty of that is if there's not enough water available. This tree has the ability to drop those leaves, which do require a lot of moisture, but it can still photosynthesize with that green bark. So it's a very cool adaptation. And then something like our desert milkweed. This is something you'll see when you go out hiking in the deserts here. It, it's our definitely a regular milkweed, just like you see like this one, but without the leaves. <laughs> and it will attract the monarchs. And so this is a plant that we have out at the Monarch Haven and Reading Sanctuary out at, out at Red Mountain Library. And it has just adapted by losing big leaves. It has little tiny skinny ones that'll develop, but mostly it's green stems that photosynthesize. And of course, things like creosote, which just has that smaller leaf. It has a very resinous leaf. That's the smell you smell when it rains, that kind of that beautiful scent that we that we get and if you ever squeeze these you'll notice they're resinous they have a little bit of stickiness to them and that helps keep them more you know keep the leaf from losing water uh, and things like our brittle bush and desert marigolds they're very light colored and reflective of the sun so these are just some of the adaptations that many of our plants have now if you're looking for plants for wildlife this is a little interpretive sign we created for red mountain or, or i'm sorry mesa community college main campus and it's just kind of giving you those basics how you create a wildlife habitat you definitely want the food and to me the best food you can provide are the plants i really i don't even like to do um, hummingbird feeders just because that's a big responsibility and to do it right and make sure you're cleaning them the, the feeders properly and so forth and if i can grow plants that'll attract the hummingbirds and let the plants do everything for me i am all for that so so i think with the food it's great if you can find the plants that are going to attract them you also want to create shelter for like nesting areas and you want to have some kind of water source so that can be just a little bird bath kind of thing or a little small little fountain just some type of water source is needed to attract the wildlife and all those will really be really helpful for for your pollinators and things like that uh, if you're looking for plants for other purposes i talked about the year-round color some people are looking for plants around the pool uh, there's great information in the Landscape Plants for the Arizona Desert booklet. Again, you can order that with us and get your free copy. 
or it's available online at uh, amwa.org forward slash plants. That's all going to be in my resource list. And it has uh, the plants listed. You'll see that it it has more information uh, and the book has it in a little chart. It'll tell you if it attracts certain wildlife or what it's if it's good for a pot. Uh, but the AMWA site, the online site, actually has a look at the very top menu and you'll find uh, an option for some of those other functions in your landscape and it'll give you listings so that's good so this is like plant combinations as an example it has an example you know a listing for plant combinations and this is showing uh, the agave desmantianas that looks like a variegated that looks like a regular green I think um, this is the beautiful evening primrose one of my favorite favorite flowers uh, this is elephant's food, and it looks like a little Angelino daisy. So just a beautiful little combination here, and it has those ideas for you. I'm just went through. A f I'm just adding a few plant pictures just because we're talking plants. But desert willow is a beautiful small tree. It provides you with that seasonal shade. It'll lose those leaves in the winter, but then you'll get that sunshine if it's around a if it's near a window that's gonna you're gonna want that winter sun. This is. The red bird of paradise it's the yellow selection so this is the one we typically see but just to let you know there is this yellow selection that's out there so just some fun plants i wanted to share with you the there's the little leaf cordia and um, there's also a big leaf cordia so those are two really fun plants to grow as well you'll see these along the freeways a lot with the little white flowers Creosote's one of my favorites. I would never have a yard without them. I highly recommend them. With a little bit of water, they almost look like a juniper, and they do give you that beautiful scent we talked about. Uh, just a great plant to have. Uh, and the Chihuahuan sage, we call this barometer plant because, especially during the humidity, you know, they'll, these will all be bursting into bloom. You're going to see a beautiful display not only the Chihuahuan sage, but all the other Texas sages that are out there. And they're all going to be bursting into bloom with this rain and humidity that we had. So um, it's just a close up of the flowers. It's got a beautiful scent as well. And then uh, bear grass, just a nice tough plant that's just kind of an accent and just gives you a nice uh, tough plant to put in the landscape. OK, the seventh principle is, let's see where I'm at. All right proper maintenance. So you want to make sure you walk your landscape, water and prune properly, fertilize sparingly, check for leaks, remove weeds that compete for water, and know when to stop. So sometimes we overdo it when we're out there. So with watering, is there's a science and an art to it. When I first started putting our booklet together, I jokingly called it 357 Easy Steps to Landscape Watering. We have a beautiful book available for you. Um, but we, we, we did reduce it to know how much water your plants need, know how much water each part of the, your system applies and match them together. And all that's in the book. And there's an online version as well. So, uh, and we also do our watering reminder once each month. So make sure you sign up for that. So it is uh, on, online as an interactive guide. And basically just some things to remember that our water use is much higher in the summer than it is in the winter and make sure you're adjusting during the year to make sure you're not overwatering during those cooler months. You can see if we're in July now we've actually water usage needs have actually gone down a little bit and that's because our day length is starting to shorten that happens after June 21st and because our humidities have uh, increased because of monsoons. And just keep in mind with drip systems it's uh, you know, you get a, such a small amount of water that comes out. So a drip, drip. And, you know, and if you if you happen to be running your system, which I hear a lot uh, people do is for just 15 minutes, you're only applying a quart of, of water and that's not enough. And just as an example, if you have a watering hose, um, it takes you two seconds to apply a quart. Uh, so that, you know, you wouldn't just water your plants by going, you know, one, 1,000, two, 1,000, you know, and just move on to the next one. So keep that in mind. We do have salt buildup here. And so you want to make sure if we don't get rains, good, good soaking rains that are going to wash some of those salts through that you give your plants an extra long drink, especially in the summertime. And our basically the mantra is water deeply, but infrequently. So by watering deeply, we're encouraging the roots to go deeper in the soil where it stays moist longer and it's cooler. And it they're more able to withstand the heat by doing that. And this just shows kind of the depths for 
small plants you'd want to go you know up to about a foot deep with the water with shrubs a foot and a half to two feet deep and with trees two and a half to three feet are good don't forget rainwater harvesting how can we forget today uh, so we can get up to 400 gallons uh, from just half an inch of rain off the rooftop and our driveways and our sidewalks that's great perfect water it's so much better than sorry the salty water that we have as our as our tap water so please take advantage of that uh, make sure you're do, controlling your weeds because they will compete with your with your plants for water and remove them after we get this rain try to go out there and remove them right now because you can pull them out roots and all and here's just some you know more natural uh, weed killers that you can find at the nurseries pruning only when necessary keep those lower limbs on the branches. Uh, improper pruning will cause rejuvenation and cause the plant to need more water. This is a Palo Verde tree. Uh, we joked uh, at the last class about this being the person who did this was inspired by this uh, mural on the McDonald's building. But anyway, and if you, I'm not, I didn't want to get into this, but I wanted to show you that if you don't understand that there are these very specific re recommendations for pruning, then you put down the saw and, and hire a professional <laughs> or get some information and teach yourself the, the proper pruning methods. And these are just the, you know, don't do this. This is much better. Uh, don't do this, you know, keeping at least like they, like about a 10 o'clock and two o'clock. Uh, you can take these lower fronds off, but even a 90 degree with the fronds is much preferred on your palm trees with something like a Palo Verde, keep at least two thirds of the canopy on there instead of this kind of pruning and what they call lion's tailing. It's very stressful for the tree. Uh, your citrus, this is very stressful when you prune it up. You can put the white paint, but there's also a brown paint called Go Natural. But this is a citrus tree here that's right to the ground and shading itself. So those things are very beneficial. Don't do all the shearing. That can be really stressful for the plants too. These are some Texas, uh, some Chihuahuan sage, that one that I showed you earlier, that are just sheared up. And you know, it's just, it's just gonna, they just start dying off because they're too stressed. This is what they should look like. And again, this is yellow bells. Uh, this was the way I, the first picture I took and then they sold the house and I came back and they had done this and I was so disappointed. So. Uh, this is just that natural look and you, you got the flowers and when you do the shearing you're cutting flowers off and everything else. With fertilizing just follow your product recommendations. Remember that fertilizer can stimulate growth and that cause more water use. Uh, and native plants don't need fertilizers typically. They, if, they're, if they have a bean pod that means they're legumes and they, they, uh, they have nodules that actually capture uh, nitrogen out of the air and fertilize themselves. So that's an example of the mesquite beans that show that they're legumes. Uh, just for summer maintenance, you know, you've got to check those irrigation systems frequently. Again, that deep lean and frequently. Make sure you're shading some of your plants if you're finding that they are having trouble with this heat that we're having. Keep that mulch on and replenish the mulch. Again, with weed removal, pruning properly and fertilizing sparingly. So that's specifically for summer, making sure you're checking your you know, timer to replace your your battery there in case of thunderstorm and the power outage. Making sure you're checking your sprinkler heads because they do get broken pop off. And oh my gosh, I have had so much trouble. Uh, here's an emitter that's popped off on the end of this uh, this uh, drip tubing, and I think it's because of the heat. And these are compression fittings where the emitters uh, go into go into the tubing and everything. And I've just had a lot of uh, leaks myself that we've had to fix. And then of course, just something like the dog or any animals, rabbits will get out there and damage. So for does design ideas, design to me is the biggest part of your xeriscape landscaping. And I always say I'm a horticulturist. I am not a designer. I love having designers help. But if you are a do-it-yourselfer and if you're artistic and you just feel like you know what you want, these are just some of the design ideas. Um, there's uh, water use it wisely. We have this great uh, page that's all about if you'd like Mediterranean or Sonoran Desert look, this is showing the Southwestern or Tropical Mexican. And then we have a plant list for you. So you can just click on these tabs and you'll see all those different um, different styles, just as, as a something to give you some guidance. The other thing is uh, we have these other 
uh, design ideas that I have came up with years ago when I was thinking about what really makes a difference in a design. It's grading your yard. I mentioned that. I love the addition of boulders and granite. It provides some great definition and the type of granite. You want to be very careful. I love going to rock yards. <laughs> it's a very important decision for your yard. Make sure about your views and then um, and then some add some nice hardscaping. It doesn't have to be super expensive. You can find some inexpensive ways to do it. That means your walkways or benches. And then energy conservation. We talked about that, placing your trees. The common themes and grouping plants. I think that's important not to have one of everything in your yard to make it look like a botanical garden versus you know a, a something that's cohesive. And then I just love using native plants and actual wildflowers. I just think they add such charm um, to the landscape. But you can see things like uh, using permeable paving. We've got all these ideas on, again, the Water Use It Wisely site. And the Drab to Fab Backyard Rehab, also on Water Use It Wisely, we have a 10-part video series. And they're only about six to eight minutes long, each, each video. And it, it took you through that we had a contest. And uh, Lisa from Avondale won the package. And her yard, I this before picture isn't here, but you can see it online. And it just was very drab, very hardly anything there. She had a couple of dying citrus and uh, my time is up. Let me, I think I'm done. One more thing, um, great examples, uh, this residential landscape revitalization books from the city of Scottsdale. Uh, and it has, you can see different styles of landscapes. You could just get an idea from them and see how you can put your design together. The resources available, our booklets and everything, we've, we'll have all that information for you online. The watering guide is uh, online version is uh, very interactive and very easy to use. And we've got things like rainwater harvesting information on the Water Use It Wisely site, and then the, the plants site that I told you about and the Xeriscape site online. Uh, class is coming up. We've got August 18th. We're going to have one just about plants. So we'll really be able to talk, talk about plants there. And September, we're working on something fun, but don't have it secured yet. And then um, don't forget that all the programs will be available on YouTube. We did one last month. It's available already. Uh, and then this is that site again that uh, gives you all these resources and I'll have links. And I actually haven't updated this page yet for today's talk, but I will do that. So you'll have a listing of the plants that I talked about today. And I'll make sure I add any other links that I didn't give last time. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I went a little bit over there. Stephanie, or do that's we have any questions right. that came in? I, I don't see anything in the chat. Anybody got something tough for me? Come on. Okay. I think you're just stunned by all the information that you give us. Give us. <laughs> stunned. <Okay. You're> excellent. <laughs> Overwhelmed. As usual, Donna, thank you so much. And uh, a lot of great ideas for people to start uh, designing on their own. And uh, I just wanted to mention that those booklets are also available at your library. Thank you. So you can come and come here and pick up uh, any of the booklets. Um, we also have some of the information on the water leaks and whatnot too, if you can ask for those as well. Right. But, um, but thank you again, Donna, that was a great presentation. And, uh, and we will, uh, if anybody specifically would like a link to the recording, uh, let me know and I can send that out to you by email. Um, if not, it, as Donna said, it will be uh, uh, available on the YouTube uh, the library's YouTube channel. Um, and, and I will add it to yes. that resource page when it's available as well. Yes, thank you. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Appreciate it. Go thank forth you. and zero escape. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, be sure and look for our next gardening programs online. And take care. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for coming.